Welcome to Real Planning, where we look at construction projects from famous movies and analyze how they might have actually been planned and scheduled. This would mean that the first availability of escape through a finished tunnel, Tom, would be mid-August, and all tunnels should be completed and ready to use by the end of September. How close was our as-planned schedule to our as-built? Oof. Okay. So what happened to our beautiful plan? The first few activities go as planned, with the traps to all three tunnels being created and hidden on time. It's bloody good. As well, Tom's shaft construction goes smoothly, 30 feet straight down. While it's being fitted with reinforcement and prepped for tunneling, Wally Floody moves to start work on the next shaft, B200, for Dick. After several days of digging, the entire shaft collapses in on itself and Wally is almost buried alive. He was able to climb to safety just before the sand reached his neck. A four-day delay occurred due to this, and therefore C200, heavy shaft excavation, started four days late. Unfortunately, an almost identical collapse occurred during Harry's shaft excavation. Another four-day delay occurred due to this dangerous setback. Four times today. We must have more wood. Even at a depth of 30 feet, the dirt was too fine to provide enough stability, making cave-ins far too common. I don't get it. Keeping all three tunnels fortified properly was an ongoing challenge. Sand dispersal, E100, was able to keep up with the tunneling efforts, and it looked like Big X's plan was going swimmingly. However, it was soon discovered that the Germans were building a second adjacent camp to house the influx of American prisoners being captured. When the south compound was finished being constructed, nobody was sure who would be moved into there or what might happen. This created a must-finish-by date that Roger wanted to meet. To attempt this, he had Dick and Harry halt construction and for all three crews to work on Tom around the clock. This is a scenario that happens very commonly in projects where we have to add extra shifts. I'm going to show you how to do it in P6. There are a bunch of different ways. I'm going to show you the easiest way. This is a tunneling project from one of our advanced courses and you can see there's all this tunneling work. We broke it into 20 day increments. All of the tunneling totaled up as 166 days of work with this level of effort. So on each of these activities, you can see I have my tunneling crew assigned and they are set to work 10 hours per day. So what I'm going to do instead of messing with calendars and creating a new crew that has a slightly different name, all I'm going to do is change the budgeted units per time here from 10 to 20. Okay, so my crew will work 20 hours and in my head you can think of that as a morning shift and an evening shift, two 10 hour shifts. Now notice when I did that, nothing really happened here to the duration, but I want my duration to be adjusted when I adjust these work crews. So I'm gonna put this back, and we're gonna look at this field called duration type. Because it says fixed duration, the duration is not changing, so we have to change our duration type to like fixed units per time, and let's fill that down, okay? And now we come back and change and double the amount of hours in a day to 20, you'll see that the duration changes down to 10. That's the behavior I want, so you need to work with duration types. Now, how do I do this quickly for all of these tunneling crew assignments? Well, I can go to the resource assignments page, and I can just take this 20 hours per day and fill it down as well. And if I come back, I'll see that all of my activities are now halved. All I have to do is just reschedule the project like this, and I can see that all of my tunneling went from 166 days down to 83 days. That's the easiest way to double a crew or add an extra shift in P6. The decision to put all of their efforts into Tunnel Tom worked out great. And with three crews digging around the clock, they were able to progress six feet per day. But on August 4th, tunneling had to be temporarily shut down. The Germans knew something was up. Foresters were brought in to start clearing trees directly where Tunnel Tom was headed. About 50 feet of extra tunnel distance was needed now due to this. Not only that, but the guards started digging a giant trench right around Hut 123. They were convinced something was being dug there, but couldn't find or prove anything. The escape committee wasn't thrilled about this, obviously. 
However, they were slightly amused when the German guards gave up digging their trench after only getting down five feet. These two events caused the tunnel to be delayed 10 days. Progress resumed afterwards, and by early September, Tunnel Tom was around 285 feet, just 20 short of the new tree line. But on September 8th, by sheer unlucky coincidence, a guard stumbled upon the trapdoor entrance to Tom when he dropped a heavy tool and cracked a piece of the trapdoor. It was a gutting experience for every man in Stalag Roof 3. After digging 300 feet of tunnel, reinforcing its structure with over 4,000 bedboards, and removing and dispersing 70 tons of sand, they were no closer to freedom. Shortly after, explosives were planted and Tom was demolished. Let me quickly mention that when creating this project, I leaned very heavily on Plan Academy's own construction planning and scheduling course. I am by no means a scheduling or P6 expert. I leave that to Michael. But after going through just half of the course, I was easily able to learn WBS theory, activity structures, and sequencing and relationships in order to understand how a construction schedule is conceived and created from the ground up. I'll leave a link to that course in the description below so you can go check it out. Three and a half months later, in early January 1944, Big X, Roger Bushel, ordered Tunnel Harry to be reopened. Tunneling in the winter was thought of as a non-option. You can't disperse of sand all over when the ground is covered in bright white snow. They needed a different solution. The camp had a theater with enclosed raised auditorium style seating. All they had to do was make a few trap doors under some of the seats and then basically the whole building could be used as a dumping grounds. Why didn't anybody think of that before? When Roger closed Harry down initially, it was only around 65 feet in length. After some quick, moderate repairs and upkeep, progress was able to get back underway. There was a week-long delay in February when there were bright, cloudless nights. This made smuggling the sand to the theater too risky. But after the delay, progress continued. And then, in March, they finally reached the tree line. The shaft up to the surface was started, and the next period of moonless nights was circled on the calendar. March 24th was the day set for escape. Months of forging documents, stealing items, clothing and tools, bribing guards for IDs, and even cameras had resulted in a bounty of disguises and equipment to be used for the escape. All they needed now was courage and a lot of luck. Good luck. Thank you. You should check out the movie yourself if you haven't already. I wanted this video to focus on the plan and construction leading to the escape. I couldn't do it justice to the movie or the true story in a short epilogue here. I would like to mention that the structure of the tunnel itself worked great and withstood the test of the escape and the test of time. The next video I'm working on like this is all about the hypothetical project schedule of the Death Star. So be sure to like and subscribe to our channel if you would want to see that. As well, feel free to check out one of our other planning and scheduling videos.